Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the BioExcel student webinar. This time we have the Winter School 2020 edition, and with, with us there are three presenters. Artemi Benandi from Italian Institute of Technology, Russian Shrestan from Tiburvan University that is located in Nepal, and Laura John from University of Oxford. I'm Alessandra from the Royal Institute of Technology that I will host together with Julian this uh, BioXL webinar. And with us, there is also Marta from ABI in Manchester. So today presenter will be are from different countries. So you can see we have Artemi from the Italian Institute of Technology that will speak about uh, modeling electrostatic interaction and solvation in chromatin. And it's going from the single nucleosome to the chromatin fiber. Then it will follow for Russian uh, Shrestan, that from uh, Trivuvan University. And it will speak about molecular dynamic simulation of nanoparticles in model bilayer, lipid phase separation, and membrane protein interaction. And the last will be Laura John from the University of Oxford. And she will still speak about membrane, large scale membrane movement induced by surface charge reversal. Hello everyone, I am Martin Bendandi and I'm going to be uh, discussing my PhD project in modeling exotic interactions and solvation in chromatin, going from the single nucleosome to the chromatin fiber. I am a PhD candidate in physics in the University of Genoa and IT Genoa in Italy. Okay, so what is chromatin and why do we study it? Well, if you were to stretch the DNA found in the nucleus of the jugular cells, it, you would get a two meter long fiber, which then has to fit in the approximately six micrometers of diameter of, your, of the cell nucleus. So how does this work? The DNA binds itself to some proteins named histones to form nucleosomes. Nucleosomes are spools of uh, 147 base pairs of DNA, around eight of these histone proteins, and nucleosomes are separated by, uh, by linker DNA. So chromatin compacts and reinforces the DNA, and the topology of compaction tunes gene expression with repercussions and in various pathologies. So, why do we study chromatin? We do because the uh, nucleosome structure is known as atomic resolution, but the determinants of the topology of the second level of folding of DNA are still unknown. Okay, so why electrostatics and chromatin? Electrostatics is a key determinant of chromatin uh, remodeling. It is very important, but mainly because the uh, DNA fiber is very highly uh, charged because of the uh, phosphate atoms found in the DNA backbone. This means that cell propulsion in DNA in packing situations needs to be balanced by histone proteins and solvated ions. As you can see here on the right, we have an exotic map of the solvent occluded surface of 1KX5, the human, not human, the, uh, let's say, industry standard uh, nucleosome crystal, the one that is mainly used. Um, as you can see, the uh, DNA in red is uh, negative and the proteins are positively or uh, positively charged or mainly neutral. So electrostatic stabilization is achieved through a combination of direct interactions and uh, long-range electrostatic and solvent screening in chromatin. But this means that modeling internucleosomal interactions with reductionistic potential omits the explicit role of histone tails, of counter ions, nucleosome positioning, various factors that need to be taken into account for an accurate depiction of this, uh, of this interaction. So in our study of electrostatics in chromatin, we, uh, we looked at interactions both between nucleosomes and in nucleosomes. In the latter case, we looked at the importance of the histone tails, and we did this by developing a methodology to associate conformational changes with electrostatic effects in uh, protein DNA systems. So how does that work? First of all, we perform clustering analysis on molecular dynamics trajectories to extract the representative structures and have uh, a, an indication, have some contribution of the uh, dynamics of the system. 
then we calculate the exotic potential and uh, the exotic field on uh, the uh, DNA, on the DNA backbone for each structure, and infer the electrostatic forces acting on the DNA, and then compare them to uh, a protein DNA context map that tells us how many um, protein atoms are found within a certain threshold from the, uh, from the DNA. We can then correlate the structural characteristics of these, of these structures to electrostatic effects, such as the role of specific residues or the particular uh, role of intrinsically disordered proteins, so terminal region truncation, among other features. So, as I said, we looked at the role of the histone tails. These are the intrinsically disordered terminal regions of the histone proteins. Each of the eight histones in the nucleosome has an N terminal, and uh, two of them have C terminals. Um, and we were able to look at the dependence on uh, transcription or histone tail positioning. We were able to separate the radial and axial epistatic forces acting on the two DNA gyres on the nucleosome. And among else, we also looked at the effect of histone tail truncation. When it comes to interactions between nucleosomes, we uh, use DEL5, which is a poisson boltzmann solver interface with NanoShaper on structures on nucleosome pairs generated through Python scripts for intermediate distances or uh, using HADOC for very close distances in order to estimate the interaction energy of these pairs. Uh, in this process, we also uh, developed some uh, uh, some contributions to the BioPython uh, project. We developed a parser for PQR files and uh, an input-output module for PQR files, which have been integrated in BioPython as of one year, approximately. Uh, and yeah, what we do is that we begin from the human nucleosome crystal structure, which is actually Again, it's not, it is used for the study of uh, human, of uh, chromatin in humans, but it is actually not uh, human histones. I wanted to clarify that, but yeah, it is the industry standard, as I said before. Um, we use this to sample the possible rotations and translations, um, and therefore forming different nucleosome pairs and record the energy of each possible, um, of each possible combination. We also study the influence of the presence of linker DNA in these conformations and record the, uh, the energy dependence of different uh, linker DNA uh, configurations. And we, we are interested in nucleosome relative orientation and not just the different distances between nucleosomes because uh, different orientations are very important for fiber compaction locally and have global consequences because, for example, of different fiber star patterns in, in chromatin. So how did we choose which structures to, to study? We just chose them uh, based on the third class criterion using NanoShaper to calculate the volume of the structures and then to discard the, uh, the nucleosome pairs that presented uh, third clashes. This, of course, led to less statistics in small distances, which we were able to compensate using the uh, Haddock uh, docked poses. But this data is very relevant for tight compaction situation because it doesn't just give us a measure of the interaction energy, but it also tells us which uh, nucleosome positioning configurations are feasible in, in the fiber, in the chromatin fiber. So then we uh, one thing we can see from these calculations is that we can see where the threshold in internucleosome distance is after which we can just reduce nucleosomes to the monopole approximation. And this, our calculations enable us to create a map of interaction energy between nucleosomes, the data from which can be used to parameterize a functional form to describe uh, nucleosome interaction energies. Here in this plot, you can see you can see some points that look like outliers. They don't follow the general trend of other of other structures around them. What this is actually the contribution of the linker DNA that I was discussing before. Looking at these structures, we saw that the linker DNA adopted particular configurations, which, as we can see from the energetics, are favorable. They lead to favorable. Um, 
nucleosome positions. So what we want to do is to be able to describe electrotic interactions in the chromatin fiber in, in scales that are relevant for chromatin compaction. What we do is that for large distances, we just use the monopole approximation by describing nucleosomes as dielectric spheres immersed in solution. For intermediate distances, we also place a dipole inside the nucleosome, therefore introducing the orientation dependence. And in, this has the added benefit that in large distances, it falls naturally into the previous case, into the monopole approximation. We can gauge how well we're doing this by comparing, uh, by comparing with the uh, numerical Poisson-Boltzmann data that I showed before. And finally, to tie everything together, what we want to do is to expand in five interacting centers, one placed in the center of mass of the nucleosome, uh, two more centers in the DNA linker DNA entry and exit sites, which then again provide orientation and on the linker DNA in order to be able to describe electrostatics in, in chromatin relative orders of magnitude. Besides, uh, besides all this, we also looked at solvation in chromatin. We, uh, so we observed the fact that consistent with previous literature, the nucleosome core particle presents high solvent and dissolved ion accessibility meaning that, as you can see here, we, uh, we built the uh, solvent to the surface of 1kx5, the industry standard crystal that I mentioned before, and we were able to see the channel traversing the histone core in blue here and the adjacent open cavity. This channel is important because it, it makes the histone core accessible to solvent and therefore to dissolved ions enhancing the screening of the charges of the of the DNA. Furthermore, on the uh, on the salvation, uh, let's say, point of view, we uh, we measured the zeta potential on nucleosomes. The zeta potential is the mean value of electrokinetic potential uh, measured by light scattering techniques. It is uh, widely used in colloid chemistry and in other fields. In biology, and to our knowledge, we are introducing it to the study of chromatin. And uh, we measured the zeta potential on single nucleosomes under varying ionic conditions. What we saw, of course, was what we were expecting to see, the fact that the zeta potential becomes less negative as the uh, ionic concentration becomes uh, higher. And we also uh, we were able to calculate, to reproduce these results um, Computationally, we were able to calculate the values of the zeta potential on the estimated position of the slipping plane using the full nonlinear Poisson Boltzmann equation. Again, we uh, were able to observe the, um, a, uh, a similar trend here. Um, so, finally, I'm just going to leave you with some uh, conclusions. Chromatin is a multi scale system in both space and time and therefore its study requires the synergy of multiple modeling paradigms and experimental data. Electrostatics is very important in, um, in chromatin folding because of the high charge uh, on, the, uh, on the DNA backbone. And we looked at chromatin electrostatics both through intranucleosome interactions and internucleosome interactions. For interactions in nucleosomes, we developed a methodology to investigate the exotic determinants of protein nucleic acid interactions and applied it to the histone tails, where we studied the, uh, their, their role in the stabilization of nucleosomes and the tuning of uh, chromatin transcription. And then we, uh, we studied exotic interactions between nucleosomes and developed a map of uh, of interaction energies using energy calculations in uh, in nucleosome pairs at different relative distances and rotations. And this gave us estimates of the interaction intensity and the basis for the parameterization of an analytical model. Finally, we looked at solvation in chromatin, both experimental and computationally, and placed all of this in the wider context of custom cross-grained approaches for chromatin. 
So to conclude, I would like to thank my supervisors in IIT, Professor Alberto Diaspero, Dr. Vaterocchia, Dr. Silvia Dante, and in Anoscopy and Concept Labs in, uh, in IIT. And of course, the organizers of the BioXL Winter School and this webinar who allowed me to present here and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Atemi. And now we move to our second speaker. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Uh, hi all, uh, my name is Rosen Schwester. Uh, today I'll be presenting our work on the molecular dynamic simulations of nanoparticles, uh, where I'll be briefly talking about the earlier work being done by our group in terms of lipid phase separation in mixed bilayers uh, due to the presence of nanoparticles, and then our current work on the interaction between memory protein and nanoparticle. Uh, I'll be presenting this work on behalf of Dr. Sang Yong No from the University of Warwick and Dr. Anton Nass from the University of Oxford. Uh, I'll be dividing my presentation basically two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll give you a preview on why nanoparticles is important, uh, some work being done within our group in terms of the interaction of nanoparticles with mixed bilayers. And then in uh, the later part, over, I will shift the emphasis on our current work, where we build on this earlier work, uh, interaction between the striped and hydrophobic nanoparticle with the transmembrane protein. So uh, the aim of our research is to understand whether nanoparticles have any impact on the conformational arrangement of integral transmembrane proteins or not. And to achieve the same, uh, we are particularly looking at uh, tips. Uh, the first one is, uh, will a hydrophobic nanoparticle have, uh, have an impact on the, have any impact on the uh, digital packing of a model integral transmembrane protein? And, uh, uh, and will a striped nanoparticle have any effect or impact on the helical packing of model integral transmembrane protein? So as you agree that, the, uh, that there are enormous varieties of nanoparticles having lots of functionalities, nanoparticles are being extensively used in different fields. And uh, the field that's being used mostly these days are in the field of biomedical research. These are drug different types of the nanoparticles that are being developed and designed uh, to to deliver the drug. Uh, for our work, we have used uh, ligand functionalized gold nanoparticles. Uh, basically, we have used gold nanoparticle uh, because of its versatility. We can easily functionalize it in different ways and it can be prepared in range of sizes. And also because of its biocompatibility. And now I will discuss in brief uh, this particular work uh, on the aggregation of strap nanoparticles in mixed phospholipid bilayers. We formed the basis and work on incorporating uh, uh, protein in our models, uh, which I'll talk about shortly. So this, work, uh, this work is a force grain where we use Martini force field to build the system uh, to look at the interaction of strapped nanoparticles with uh, these strapped nanoparticles consist of hydrophobic ligands uh, uh, on the inter region and just ligands in the exterior region. So, uh, so if you can actually look at the course snapshot, then you can see it is lipid extensive nanoparticle and it is in the uh, in unsaturated domain against saturated domain so that uh, there is an increased liquid like disorder state uh, near the nanoparticles near the nanoparticles uh, uh, so uh, basically in this diagram what you can actually see that this dbpc is represented by red and yet, um, just, just give me a moment. Is, uh, these uh, DPC is represented by red, and this is represented by green, and this DPC is represented by blue. 
So uh, now I want to sorry short snap that we performed uh, for the multi nanoparticle system. So we can see that there is aggregation of nanoparticles within the unsaturated domain of the bilayers, uh, which uh, I shortly showed you during this short animation in here. So in the control simulation with just the DPPC, we can see some aggregation behavior of nanoparticles. Now, as we add more complex constituents, like when we add cholesterol, there is enhanced aggregation. Whereas when we further add DFPC and DUPC, there is local lipid exchange around the nanoparticles. So we can actually see the formation of domains around the nanoparticles. Now, now uh, the uh, like the main intuition for us to use uh, to do our current work is that membranes are complex and crowded environment. From the work that I actually showed you earlier, that can actually clearly see that the nanoparticles are not just some static objects, nothing to the membrane environment. Now, nanoparticles are not just it's have an impact on the bilayer when these nanoparticles are embedded on the bilayer. Now, one of the major component of the membrane is membrane proteins. And in our work, we want to see what impact or effect these nanoparticles have on the membrane protein when they are embedded in the bilayer. So now the reason why we are interested on membrane proteins, the reason why we are interested in membrane proteins is approximately one third of genes in the human genome encode trans proteins, and they form more than half of all drug targets. However, it's very difficult to understand building of these proteins, membrane proteins into their function form, into their function form, as well as how they misfold into a disease associated form. Now, very difficult areas of study, study, and they are remaining so. In the in see there, there are different types of membrane proteins. Protein, membrane protein that you all may already know. B is integral membrane protein where the subunits are represented by different colors. C is polytopic membrane trans membrane protein and D is beta barrel trans membrane protein. Now, well, uh, the structural stability of trans membrane domain of membrane protein depends on the interhelical packing of conserved amino acid motifs, uh, which are basically the specific arrangement of amino acids. Now, these uh, special arrangements, or let's say, specific arrangement of amino acids such as GG4, uh, leucine zipper, and alanine zipper, uh, which you can see on this figure on the left, uh, uh, are, are, are play a crucial role in understanding for this trans membrane protein. The model trans membrane protein uh, domain that we are using belongs to the glycophorin A integral trans membrane protein. Now, it is a basically homodimer consisting of two identical peptides. Now, their stability as a homodimer is facilitated by these GG4 motif. Now, basically, in this GG4 motif, you can actually see that this glycine residue repeats after the fourth position. Now, what does this GG4 motif does is that they can maximize the interfacial, interfacial van der Waals interaction and or hydrogen bonding by allowing the interhelices to be in proximity, that means in close with each other. Now, what, are, what we want to see is if there is any disruption to the interaction between these GG4 motifs in the presence of nanoparticle or not. As we know that these GG4 motifs have a crucial role in the folding up. Protein. Now, in our work, uh, we are looking at uh, basically two, two different types of nanoparticles. One is hydrophobic nanoparticle, another one is strap nanoparticle. Now, of the, uh, and we are actually looking at the interaction between these nanoparticles with the transmembrane domain of the glycophorin A. We thought about how we can look for changes in the structure of protein, and that's why we are performing these case and control simulations. Epidemiology terms, but now, now in in control, uh, what to, uh, in control we are not expecting 
to see any changes where we have the intermolecular distance between the nanoparticle and protein separated by more than nine nanometer. Whereas in the case simulation, the nanoparticle is placed next to the protein and we, 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 are, we expect the interaction between these nanoparticle and these uh, uh, and the membrane protein. Now, the uh, I'll be talking about the model later as well. Now, the, we have actually used the TPPC phospholipid bilayering here. So, we can see on the figure on the right that, that uh, the uh, transmembrane proteins and uh, and uh, and the nanoparticle are either placed uh, next to each other for both the striped as well sorry for both the striped and the hydrophobic nanoparticle uh, for the hydrophobic nanoparticle and they are placed uh, for the distance like around greater than nine, nine nanometer when we are doing control simulations now if you look closely at the nanoparticle structure then the nanoparticle core consists of inner and outer gold atoms and the thylated gold atoms which are the base of the ligands and the structures come from extra derived functionalized nanoparticles now, this consists of aromatic functional groups while the polar group consists of hydroxyl and amide groups now the ligand sites themselves are attached onto aus motifs each with slightly different angles and connectivity parameters depending on the shape of the uh, AU code itself. Now, the ligands themselves can be through PDB formats of the desired ligands. Now, if you look at the structure of the glycophorin, then we build the system in the amber force field where we used TIP3P water model and DPP slippers were used. And again, I have already told you that we use glycophorin transmembrane uh, homodimer, a domain that is basically a homodimer consisting of two identical peptides. Now the GC4 motif is colored in yellow. Now it mediates this transmembrane domain dimer. Now this V is basically a right-handed dimer with a crossing angle of approximately 25 degrees. Now, now, now the analysis that we actually did, uh, there are different analyses that we actually did, but we do uh, uh, principal component analysis uh, can be used to reduce or let's say simplify large and complicated sets of data. Uh, in the PC analysis, uh, the greatest degree of uh, variance can be explained by the initial few principal components. Here, the projection of the distribution uh, onto the space defined by these by these principal components result in a lower dimensional representation of the data set. Now, basically, we can actually understand or find uh, looking for some structural variance in the uh, of our system, of our protein for now. So we are using PCA to discover do the atomic coordinates cluster into unique states or not. Now, in the plots on the left, uh, in the plots on the left, red one shows the PC1 as a function of time, and the black one shows the PC2 as a function of time. Now, clearly, clearly there are conformational states indicated by small amount of so sorry. So basically, there are clearly there are conformational states being indicated uh, being uh, indicated by very small amount of structural variances, which are visited uh, the most amount of time during the simulation. We can actually see it uh, through the contour plots on the on the right. Now here, these arrow indicates uh, indicates the confirmation sampling as time passes. Now, now before we are, we look at any structural work, we could see that that there is variance in the protein atomic protein uh, atomic coordinates, and we can see that the protein is uh, is adopting different conformations. Right, so basically, basically, the protein can be like in this state, spend most of the time in this, in this state, in this state, and in this state. We can see similar this thing in other kind of the simulation work as well. Now, now uh, we did uh, we did the distance measurement where you basically calculate the uh, distance between the center of geometry of the nanoparticle and protein when they are uh, placed next to each other for both the hydrophobic and striped nanoparticle. Right. So here in the case uh, stripe, uh, stripe nanoparticle, what you can actually see that this stripe nanoparticle uh, moved away from the protein. So here in the stripe nanoparticle, we are gold nanoparticle, you can actually see that this stripe nanoparticle moved away from the transmembrane protein at around 5.8 nanometer and then it's just to this average distance of 5 nanometer. However, the hydrophobic nanoparticle remains within this 
interaction distance of the uh, interaction distance with transmembrane protein, and the and we can actually see the uh, increase in the crossing angle for the for the hydrophobic nanoparticle. Now, the another work that we did was what we're, we're, we're trying to understand is like, uh, is there any change in the uh, secondary structure of the transmembrane dimer or not due to the presence of the nanoparticle or not? Now, uh, now we looked at the helical secondary structure of the protein as a function of time, and we start to compare the hydrophobic together versus hydrophobic apart. That is our case and control, and we did it for uh, for same for the stab nanoparticle as well. So we basically calculated the helical content of the uh, in the protein for both the hydrophobic as well as the stripe in both cases. That means yeah, when they are apart and when they are uh, when they are together. Now from the plot on the right, we can we found that we could not account for any change in the helical structure of the protein due to the presence of nanoparticles. So there is no basically there is no change in the helical content, right? But it's not just the alpha helical content that we looked after. We actually looked after other structures as well. So you can actually see from these uh, structure, second structure that we analysis we did from the VMD. From the VMD, so the helical content was extracted from the VMD secondary structure and like calculation. And basically, we can see that this there is not much of a change in the helical content for for the cases where when they were either apart or when they were when they're together for both the hydrophobic nanoparticle and for the stem nanoparticle as well. Now, now the thing that we actually did was well, I well. Russian, sorry, there is one minute left. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, well, the structural stability of the transmembrane domain of the membrane protein depends on the interhelical packing of conserved amino acid motifs. Now, what we need to understand is this: that we also calculated the distance, uh, distance between the center of mass of the of the protein and the uh, of the of these two peptides. For both the when the uh, transmembrane domain uh, uh, when the transmembrane domain and the nanoparticle were together, that is for the hydrophobic as well as for the for the stripe when they were together, and also for when the uh, when they're apart. Now we can actually see that there is that that the that does not affect the GC4 packing interaction at all, right? So so we can't account for any change in the change in the GC4 packing interaction. Uh, uh, due to the presence of the nanoparticle. So, so basically what we did that we, we have performed initial atomic all atom uh, simulation of, uh, of these, uh, of the low complexity uh, gold nanoparticle in the presence of model transmembrane uh, protein diamond in a model bilayer. Now, now we know, now we can actually say that G4 is known to stabilize this glycophorin interhelic interactions that is neither gold nanoparticle affects uh, GC4 packing. Now, however, from the distance calculation that we did that the strat nanoparticle, gold nanoparticle moves away from protein, whereas the hydrophobic gold nanoparticle continues to interact with the protein and the protein's crossing angle is adjusted. However, uh, we want to do is like we want to do more structural analysis, modifications, we want to see uh, if the modification of uh, good nanoparticle ligands will will account for changes in the protein structure or not that we actually uh, did from the CLS. So, myself uh, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to present our work and uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move to our to Laura. That is our last talk of uh, today. Yeah, so hi, my name is Laura. I'm a PhD student in the lab of Professor Mark Sansom. And in my um, project, I'm looking at the interactions between membranes and proteins. And for this, I use a combination of Newton reflectometry measurements and molecular dynamic simulations. And today I want to present you um, some very interesting effects I saw in my experimental model membrane system and how I used simulations to explain these effects. So that's how my experimental system looks like. You have a surface and on top of that surface you have a gold layer and on top of that gold layer you self-assemble a self-assembling monolayer. 
Then you add your lipids in form of vesicles and via a procedure we developed, you gain a lipid bilayer shown in blue here. And crucial is now that the lipid bilayer and the self-assembly monolayer are not in contact. There's a water layer in between. So the lipid bilayer is basically free floating. That's why I call the system also free floating membrane system. Then you can add, for example, protein to your system and measure everything with neutrons. Why neutrons? Well, neutrons have a few um, advantages. They are deeply penetrating the system without destroying anything. Um, so you get information about your membrane and your protein without destroying your protein. Then you can use physiological conditions and you can change the environment during your measuring. So you can first measure the dye layer, then you can add protein and measuring the whole time. You measure basically the reflected beam and um, the information you get is something similar to a density profile from an MB simulation along the X axis. So you can get information, for example, about how deeply the protein penetrates the membrane, how far the membrane is away from the surface, what's the state of the membrane, so how rough or how curved is the membrane. But you can also get um, information about, for example, lipid distribution within the membrane or how dense the protein is bound to the membrane surface. And you can use this information in form of constraints for your simulations. And in turn, you can use your simulations to refine your fitting analysis process from the neutron data. So both techniques can feed each other for gaining structural and functional information of your system. So in my case, um, before I could actually uh, add a protein to my system, I wanted to um, see how different salt concentrations and buffer concentrations influence the membrane behavior in my sample system. So I started measuring um, the system in the presence of two millimolar calcium because that's also the salt condition you deposit your membrane. And I had a distance between the stem surface and the bilayer of around 12 angstrom. When I removed the calcium, the membrane went basically crazy. It went far away and it became a very rough state. We are talking about a distance from around 200 to 600 angstrom from the surface. When I measured the system in the presence of 200 millimoles sodium, we ended up at an intermediate state. So the membrane came partially back to the surface, but the distance is still around 40 to 100 angstrom. When I re-added calcium, the system came um, the membrane came fully back to to its initial position this process is um, repeatable and reversible and it's looking like this in your neutron data what you see here is a so-called scattering length density profile you gain when you fit your reflectivity data um, on the x-axis, you see the distance from the surface, in my case, from the gold surface. In yellow here, that's um, basically where the gold sits, and the brown layer here is where your SEM is. In the SLD profile, in my experiments, the first dip is basically always belonging to the SEM. The second dip is always belonging to the membrane. And in the different colors, you see the different salt conditions are used and you see it for different bilayers. So you can see here the different lipid compositions. In case of calcium present in the system, the membrane was always close to the SEM, um, as you can see here in orange. When I removed the cations, the membrane went far away and was very rough. Now you can see really the roughness on this really broad distribution. And when you measure the system in the presence of sodium, you had this intermediate state shown in green here for all the, all the lipid bilayers. So that was very interesting. And this um, effect you saw, like this movement was really, really large um, compared to a membrane movement. Um, and I just wanted to know, obviously, what's going on in there. So where do the cations interact? What's the difference between sodium and calcium? And what's the driving force behind these effects? And to solve these questions, I use molecular dynamic simulations. I started with a coarse grained setup of my SAM. So just the SAM in a simulation box. 
And you can see here the mapping between core strains and all atomistic. And that's one molecule from SAM. The SAM is also called OEG SAM because it has this oligoethylene glycol groups here shown in orange. At the bottom, you see the hexagonal grid along which I aligned my molecules of the SAM before and after the simulation. I used the coarse grain um, system to validate my SAM. So I looked if it behaved as it should be compared to experimental results. In terms of thickness, for example, um, distance between molecules and this angle, for example. And then I converted this coarse grain structure to an all atomistic. Force field here was Martini 3, and now I moved on to CHARM 36. I simulated my SAM in all atomistic in presence of sodium and in presence of calcium to gain the energy profile. You can see it for um, calcium in red and for sodium in black. In case you didn't see such energy profiles before, what it basically says, um, when it's getting deeper here, your well, it means something binds stronger. And you can see that the, the depth is very similar. So both ions seem to bind similarly strong. However, the sodium seems to bind more diffuse because um, you see the distribution is much broader compared to calcium. Well, now I want to compare these energy binding energies to um, sodium and calcium when it binds to different lipid bilayers. So I simulated all atomistic lipid bilayers in presence of calcium at the top and in presence of sodium at the bottom. And here you see the different lipids I use basically. When we start with calcium and compare it to the red curve for the SAM, we can see that um, calcium binds definitely stronger to the SAM, but also for the diff it also binds to the different bilayers because we always have here um, a well basically below zero. In case of sodium, it's different. We see only um, ion binding to the membrane when the highly negatively charged PIP3 lipid was included in the membrane. With um, POPC and POPC POS, we didn't see um, sodium binding to the membrane. So again, here, um, sodium seems to prefer to interact with the SAM rather than with the bilayer. And similar to the SAM, we saw also here that the sodium binding was, when there was binding, more diffuse. Um, the distribution is here much broader compared to the calcium distribution. So what can we conclude from this? Well, um, both ions um, seem to interact more with the SAM. However, calcium also interacts with the bilayer. And um, it will be the calcium interaction with the SAM will switch the negatively charged from the SAM to positive and will attract the membrane. Sodium instead um, will also interact with the SAM. However, it has lower charge and it has more diffuse binding to the SAM and it has, more, in most of the case, no binding to the bilayer. So there will be less attraction, like less bridging between this, these two layers and leading to this intermediate position. I should mention that both layers, the um, membranes and the SAM are negatively charged. So there's actually like a repulsion force between them. So if you have these ions in between, which change the charge of the SAM, you, you change this repulsion force. So why, when we say, okay, there's now an attraction, why are they not in contact, these two layers in the presence of calcium? Um, well, we, that's, we can really nicely see this when we go to the coarse grain multilayer system I simulated. So now I went back to coarse grain and simulated SAM and bilayer in the same simulation box. Hereby, the bilayer had all the time a, a hole throughout which the ions and water could equilibrate during the simulation. And then I just determined basically after one microsecond the density profiles of water shown in blue and um, of the cations shown in black for calcium on the right side and for sodium on the left side. And when you look at these blue curves, you can see that there seems to be water layers. Um, and that's known about this um, SAM OEG, OEG SAMs, these oligoethylene glycol SAMs. 
that they form the structured water layers on top. So it was really nice to actually see these water layers in the simulations as well. And we saw it in the all atomistic as well. Um, and this causes a repulsion, hydration repulsion force. So although there's an attraction, the water prevents from the prevents the bilayer to come in too close contact to the sand. So you have always this water layer in between. With this, I want to conclude and answer my um, previously asked questions. So where do the cations interact? They will preferably um, interact with SAM, although the calcium will also interact with bilayer. What's the difference between calcium and SAM? Calcium binds stronger, especially to the membrane, and will probably bridge between these layers. Sodium has a weaker binding, especially to the membrane, and will less will have a less bridging effect, especially due to the, its um, more diffuse binding. What's the driving force behind these effects? Um, the driving force is that you reduce the repulsion between the two layers because they um, um, are not fully negatively charged anymore. And um, um, you will, the same surface will change its charge basically due to cation binding. Yeah, that's um, nice, um, a nice summary, but what I really want you basically to take home from this short talk is that you have heard from this free floating bilayer model membrane system, because it's really nice this system actually, because it um, has on both sides of your membrane, biologically relevant water layer, um, which you don't have in the other um, planar model membrane systems so far. And you can actually tune this water layer by um, just changing the salt concentration in your system at physiological conditions. And the other point is what I want you to remember is that Newton refractometry and molecular dynamic simulations are working well together and can feed each other by um, gaining new insights in um, membrane behavior, especially with the system and also in protein membrane interactions. With this, I want to thank um, BioExcel for this really nice winter school we had and also for giving me the opportunity here to talk. And I want to thank my two supervisors, Mark and Luke, my, my um, research group and my funding bodies, BDBSRC, Oxford and Bioscience, DTP and ISIS, Newton and Moon Source. And last, last but not least, I also want to thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, the first question is, please could you describe in more detail the, the plot of Coulombic versus reaction field energy? And please could you uh, give some more details on how the dimers pairs of, or pairs of uh, nucleosomes were picked? Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, basically what we did is that we took the, um, we took two identic structures, two identic uh, 1kx5 uh, plus linker DNA, uh, and we also did this with uh, 3AFA, which is another uh, nucleosome crystal, which doesn't have histone tails because we wanted to check out how histone tails change the, um, the interactions. And those, those results are in my thesis. Um, but yeah, basically what we did is that we picked the nucleosome crystal that we were interested in, be that 1KX5, 1KX5 plus linker DNA, 3AFA, whatever. Then we uh, we kept one nucleosome fixed. First of all, we superimposed them. Then we kept one nucleosome fixed and rotated the other one. And then we translated the rotated nucleosome. Uh, this was done through uh, with uh, BioPython uh, through uh, uh, custom scripts that I wrote. And uh, yeah, then basically we fed those uh, structures to Delphi and. In that process, we we first used NanoShaper to discard the uh, the structures, the pairs that uh, presented steric clashes. Basically, what we did is that we calculated the volume of each pair, and if it was uh, equal or um, smaller than the volume of two separate nucleosomes, we discarded that structure because that meant that we had a steric clash there. And uh, yeah, that's that's the criterion we used. 
And then we just measured using Delphi the Columbic interaction energy and the reactor field energy of the of the pairs. So that's the that's the plot you saw, the scatter plot that you saw in which we had the Columbic interaction energy that, as I said, from a point on started following the monopole approximation, which means that rotations are no longer relevant and each nucleosome sees the other as a point charge. And in the other case, we had the uh, reaction field energy, which is basically the interaction energy from because of the fact that the nucleosomes are uh, dielectrics. And uh, yeah, I I don't know if that's too detailed or not detailed enough. Please uh, let me know. That's pretty much it. Great. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, the next question we have is uh, for Laura. And the question is, what kind of softwares can be used uh, for these sorts of MDE simulations? Um, the MDE simulations were um, done with um, Gromax. Um, just standard Gromax version and the analysis was either with Gromax or VMD. I hope this answers the question, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I think it does, thank you very much. Uh, the next question we have is um, for um, Artemi again. And uh, the question is uh, asking for more uh, information about the zeta potential data. Uh, namely, how difficult is it to do these uh, measurements and how reproducible um, are the simulations? Um, and the question ends with a, uh, by asking, uh, is this data published anywhere? Could, is there a place where people could go to read up about the work you've done? Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks for that question. So, okay, full disclosure about the experiment, the Zeta Potential experiment. It was my experimental supervisor, Dr. Silvia Dante in IIT, who actually did the experiment. I can on. I I just did the, uh, the simulation and I used the data. Okay, let's start from the easy part of the question. This data is not yet published because it's in a manuscript that we are going to, that, that we're going through right now. Uh, so the basically the first part of my talk has already been published, the part on the histone tails and protein uh, DNA interactions. And then the second part of my talk is uh, going to be published. Uh, so it's not yet public. I can send you a draft of my thesis where you can find more information and you can uh, contact me uh, privately if you if you need that and um, yeah okay so about the uh, about the reproducibility of the um, of the experiments yeah the reproducible that they were not particularly uh, challenging to do as measurements uh, at least from what I know because again I was not the person actually in the room doing the measurements um, but yeah, we used, uh, we bought nucleosomes and we we just performed the measurements on those. Um, yeah, and then the uh, the calculated values they are absolutely uh, reproducible. The only slight uh, issue, let's say, is that the position of the slipping plane is estimated. It's it's estimated as a function of the ionic strength taking as the reference the physiological ionic strength and the uh, the by length. So that's why if you uh, if you look at the plot that I showed in my presentation, you can see that there's some discrepancies. Basically, we were a bit uh, underestimating the value of the potential, but and that's we believe that this is due to the uh, to the position of the uh, the estimate of the position of the slipping plane. Uh, but yeah, uh, the results, they're reproducible and uh, the the experiment is not particularly, let's say, uh, costly from from the uh, from the complication point of view, let's put it that. Um, I, uh, if, if you if you need any more information, please don't hesitate to um, to contact me. So yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you very much for that uh, in-depth answer. The final question that we have for today is from uh, Davide. The question is for Laura. And the question is, um, 
is neutral reflectometry enough uh, sensitive enough to study transient protein metal interactions? It is. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what you mean by transient, but I guess um, you mean when the protein um, goes away again from the membrane. Um, so I just measure proteins who bind, which bind to the membrane. And um, even like I did just experiments with um, pH domains, so not very large proteins, and it's sensitive enough to see um, the binding of these um, protein domains, basically. Um, and there are a lot of different tricks to make it more sensitive. So you can, um, for example, deuterate your protein, which gives you then in neutron reflectometry a different contrast and um, to see even smaller things. So it's it's very sensitive, but sometimes it, it's quite a lot of work to make it more sensitive. <laughs> but like with a standard Newton experiment, um, I was able to see um, a pH domain binding to my to my bilayer. Um, but what you see is, is an average. Um, so you can't see like just, I don't know, you can't observe one protein, you add, like several pH domains, right? And and then you see an average. So you can't observe like a transient binding event like in simulations. Thank you very much for that answer. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all three of our speakers again for the great presentations that um, they gave. There's a number of people saying in the questions chat, um, thank you for the answers, thank you for the wonderful talks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they were very good. Um,